You're watching HuffPost Live, I'm Ahmed Shahabuddin. Now two years ago, after WikiLeaks published thousands of leaked U.S. Embassy cables exposing government secrets dating back to 1966 and through to our most recent wars, their funding dried up. But it wasn't because of a lack of public support. Quite the opposite. People from around the world rallied to their defense and hailed its founder, Julian Assange, and the alleged leaker, Army Private Bradley Manning, as heroes. However, companies such as Visa, MasterCard, and PayPal, amid pressure from U.S. government officials, created an electronic blockade which prevented supporters from donating to WikiLeaks and jeopardized their ability to survive. So, this week, a group of supportive activists and journalists have formed Freedom of the Press Foundation to financially support independent journalistic enterprises such as WikiLeaks to prevent future electronic blockades and ensure their ability to do their work. Joining me to discuss are members of the group's founding team, Daniel Ellsberg, the famed Pentagon Papers whistleblower and peace activist, John Perry Barlow, co-founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and Josh Stern, uh, journalism and public media campaign director at Free Press. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining me. I'm going to start with you, John Perry. Uh, the aim here to me seems to really insulate these groups, like WikiLeaks, these other groups uh, that are working in transparency journalism, if you will, uh, from business and political pressures. But why is it so critical at this moment? in your opinion. Uh, forgive me, John Perry, you're actually muted. If you could just unmute yourself in the top right. Yeah, no right, worries. Here we go. No here we there go. go. Yeah. Uh, as, as we all learn from Citizens United, uh, you know, there is a, there is a lot of uh, crossover between speech and money, uh, and it goes both ways. Uh, if they cut off your money, then they cut off your speech. Uh, and what what happened here was a private corporate embargo of WikiLeaks uh, that was actually undertaken without anything but pressure from two elected officials uh, and functionally silenced WikiLeaks. Senator uh, Joseph Senator 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 King, 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 correct? Yes, exactly. I mean, and, and, and they could have been two private individuals. I mean, they simply went to those those uh, funding channels and and asked them to shut shut down WikiLeaks. I don't know whose volume it is. We have some feedback. This is, I, I believe it's uh, maybe you, John Perry. Could you lower the volume just a little bit? Thanks. Sorry about that. The volume's pretty low. On your computer. So on your computer. I, I, it's my guess. Uh, it's I think guess. I have a feeling that it's the echo coming from um, Mr. Daniel Ellsberg. But why don't we try and carry on and, and hope that things um, sort themselves out? I wanted to ask you to that point do you think uh, in your piece you said they defunded rather than defended the truth? Um, do you think that was an act of censorship? It amounted to an act of censorship. I mean, uh, it, it what WikiLeaks and anything else like WikiLeaks requires is uh, a fair amount of editorial overhead in order to find the, the material that is appropriate to disseminate to the public and to sort through this gigantic body of possible material. And, and if they can't pay people to help do that, if they can't make that, that function well-funded, then they, it, it it strongly limits their ability to, to perform the necessary edit and to make the stuff available to the rest of us. Of course, and as of you course, pointed out in the piece, uh, journalism costs money. Cost money. Uh, to, that uh, point, to that point, Josh, I want to come to you. I mean, just one just in one 10 Americans, Americans actually support the work that Congress is doing. And the reason I bring that up is because uh, we often lament them for not accomplishing much, but as we just discussed, they managed to accomplish shutting down and eliminating the vast majority of funding for uh, WikiLeaks. You worry at all, by any chance, that you will meet the same fate? How are you avoiding that same fate? Well, I think the challenge here, and what, the way we've tried to address that, is by making this about a lot more than just WikiLeaks. Uh, WikiLeaks is a symbol, obviously, of what could happen, what could go wrong. But we are talking about you know, freedom of speech and uh, the First Amendment in general here. We've got three other groups, in addition to WikiLeaks, who we're giving money to uh, and who we're fundraising for. And for if we were to be shut down in any way, it would really be an assault, not just on one organization that somebody's trying to make a symbol out of, 
but of a whole range of organizations doing a whole range of kinds of important government accountability work. And so I think what we've tried to say here is that WikiLeaks is just one piece of a much larger puzzle, and this is an assault on not just WikiLeaks, but on the idea of you know, freedom of the press. And that's really what we've tried to do here is to take a step back, kind of broaden the base of support for journalism, but also broaden our understanding of what journalism looks like in a digital age. We were talking earlier, and you said that uh, the freedom of the press we enjoy today is a catch-22. What do you mean by that? Well, the same way that the digital age has given more tools uh, of media making to more people, the policies that shape our media are becoming less and less democratic. So we've got crackdowns uh, on journalists in the streets. Over 100 have been arrested in the last year in the US. We've got internet policy that threatens uh, free speech online. So there's all of these threats uh, in our policy making process, in our structural process, that are um, clamping down on the very freedoms that we're enjoying with the new internet and technologies that are in more and more people's hands. So I want to ask you a quick question before we move on to uh, Daniel. WikiLeaks tweeted this, saying, Outrageous. Freedom of the Press Foundation's Twitter account has already been suspended. This was, I think, a day or two after it had, uh, maybe even the same day after it had launched. Any insights as to why that happened? Was it a lot of people even speculating it was a publicity stunt? <laughs> uh, it freaked us out, so it was no publicity stunt. We uh, had only tweeted 12 things, but uh, our assumption is that it got somehow uh, flagged as spam or something like that. As far as we know, there was no malicious intent there. Um, we were sad to see it happen, but it was returned very quickly. It was, it was a glitch. I mean, uh, Twitter Twitter's cool. They, yeah. The yeah. last thing that would happen would be Twitter closing down our account. That's why I was surprised. surprised. No, it was... A, it really was it was a technical glitch. It had nothing to do with human intervention or anybody's opinion. Um, to that point, why don't we go to Daniel? Daniel, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Daniel, it seems we have Are you a. Talking to me? Yeah, I tell you, one of the, the arrangement we have here makes it almost impossible for me to hear the other speakers. I can hear you though, so don't uh, don't assume that I'm I'm responding to them because I really can't hear. Oh them. well, that's a shame. Well, perhaps you can hear me uh, and respond I to. Can hear you though. Yeah. Respond to this article which uh, you wrote uh, along with um, John Perry. Uh, yeah, crowdfunding. I was the main author of that, but I participated. Well, crowdfunding the right to know, there's a quote at the top right here uh, from Judge Murray Gerfin, uh, who was in the Pentagon Papers case back in 1971. A cantankerous press, an obstinate press, an ubiquitous press must be suffered by those in authority in order to preserve the even greater values of freedom, of expression, and the right of the people to know. In your estimation, uh, back then, at the time of the Pentagon Papers, did we have this cantankerous press? Uh, do you think things have evolved and, or devolved? No, we had, uh, on the whole, we had a, especially a Washington press corps that took handouts from the administration and was easily manipulated and lied to and passed those lies on to the American public. We had much better reporting from the field in those days about what was really going on in Vietnam. And the administration really made some efforts to get people like David Halberstam and Neil Sheehan out of Vietnam. They didn't like the truthful reporting they were giving. That was in the days before we had embedding and when reporters could really hop a ride to the battlefront and uh, such as there was a battlefront uh, all over in, uh, in Vietnam as it, is in, uh, as it was in Iraq and for that matter Afghanistan. The people uh, could just hop a ride, go out, watch the action and form an independent opinion and talk to people and get backgrounders as to uh, what was really going on there. The administration didn't like it. But meanwhile, in Washington, uh, the public was very well fooled into, into that war, lied into that war, disastrous war, uh, just as they were lied into the Iraq war. And in both cases, uh, what made that possible was that the, the administration could count on officials like me, at that time, keeping their mouths shut when they knew the public was being lied to. Uh, that's what I did then. I think if I told what I knew then, if I'd leaked it uh, to the, even to the Senate and to the press in 1964-65, uh, there might well not have been a Vietnam War. So that's a very heavy burden for me to bear, which I bear actually with uh, hundreds of other people who could have done the same, Daniel. whether they're conscious of it or not. Daniel, I want to ask you, the, the Supreme Court declared that the government can't censor the media from publishing truthful information in the public interest, even if it's classified. 
Um, this is not what they tried to do with WikiLeaks. This was done out of the court. This was, this was as John Perry said, just two politicians pressuring them. Um, what do you make of the fact right now that they, you know, even wrote a le letter, I believe, I have this here to Hillary Clinton, I believe it was King who wrote the letter, saying he believes WikiLeaks is a terrorist organization. I, you know, it's not a perfect organization, but is there any truth to that? To, uh, to a WikiLeaks being a terrorist organization? Yes. I would say that was a clear and terrorist. present danger to the national security of the United States. Since you were once no. called the most dangerous man in America, I'm asking you. Yeah. The, why was I dangerous uh, to uh, Henry Kissinger at the time? Because I threatened his ability to keep secret the secret threats they were making, in fact, of nuclear war against uh, North Vietnam. They wanted those to keep secret precisely because they thought the American public would uh, resist that, would uh, re resoundingly reject any such escalation of the war. And they were afraid that I had documents on Nixon that went beyond what the Pentagon Papers were. Uh, they, didn't, they really weren't that worried about the Pentagon Papers getting out because they ended in 1968, and they mainly incriminated the Democrats. So they were actually uh, happy to see those come out, but they were afraid that I had documents, and I did have some, on them that would show how they were lying and the dangerous escalations they were making. Well, likewise, right now, when, uh, for example, uh, the source to WikiLeaks, and by the way, Bradley Manning, uh, who was accused of that, uh, has recently offered through his lawyer to plead guilty to having provided Wik WikiLeaks with some information, so we don't have to uh, simply say uh, the man was accused here. I'm uh, willing to give him credit then for revealing that this administration, as well as its predecessors, was violating the law and international treaties about torture regularly by handing people over to be tortured to the Iraqi authorities, that it was hiding atrocities that Americans had, uh, had in Iraq, and that revelation made it impossible for Maliki in Iraq to allow us to keep 10 or 20,000 troops there and give them immunity from Iraqi prosecution, because the WikiLeaks documents showed clearly that we knew there had been atrocities, we covered them up, we lied about them, we did not prosecute. The result of finding that was that the American troops had to leave, now uh, against the wishes of Barack Obama. Now, some may feel that was a bad effect. I don't. I'm glad that we don't have 10 and 20,000 combat troops in Iraq, and that wouldn't, uh, they'd still be there. They'd still be there fighting and killing uh, if they, I take it, Bradley Manning had not actually revealed those truths. Uh, also, uh, Tunisia, Ben Ali in Tunisia would probably still be the dictator supported by the U.S. Of course. Tunisia, Mubarak in Egypt, if those, in, if those cables had not come out. So the effect was very great. But, of course, it interfered with our foreign policy uh, because we were backing Ben Ali and backing Mubarak. Uh, up till uh, the day that they had to leave, essentially. In short, they certainly regard uh, Bradley Manning, I think, as the new dangerous man in America because he was telling the truth that they wanted to keep secret. And they wanted to keep it secret because of deceptions and aggressive war. You know, I, I think it's, it's interesting to note and important that had it not been for a number of WikiLeaks revelations, I don't believe there would have been an Arab Spring, as, as Dan says. That's and, what I'm referring and, to. And we, and we, you know, spent trillions of dollars literally trying to bring about democracy in Arab countries. And, in fact, democracy in Arab countries was brought about by WikiLeaks as much as anything. Well, to that I point, agree only with the idea that, if I may say, I can't accept the idea that we spent trillions of dollars or any amount at all uh, backing uh, democracy in the Middle East. Our main allies in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, like Bahrain, like the others, are autocracies as severe as the Taliban or any other. There's any been democracy is not a U.S. goal in the third world. Period. And the notion well, that we I'm actually just, just support that is merely a rhetorical claim. Yeah. It's the opposite of the truth. Go ahead, John. Our, our, our stated goal in Iraq and Afghanistan has been... Stated goal, yes. Yes. So, John Perry, can I ask you something? Uh, the last line here in the piece is, what happened to WikiLeaks is completely unacceptable in a democracy that values free speech and due process. 
Do you think Americans don't value that, or do you think they do? Because the, the reason I ask you is uh, you've raised $70,000 plus uh, dollars with this new foundation in just two days. A lot of people are pointing, that, pointing to that as a success, but when you look at the mainstream media, uh, not only had, did they not come to WikiLeaks' support, uh, there are a lot of questions as to how the mainstream media might react to an organization like yours. Well, look, I mean, uh, the mainstream media sell the, the attention of their audience to their advertisers. I mean, that's the real model. And, and as such, they have a reason to be afraid of the fears of their advertisers. And their advertisers are often quite timid. Uh, the, the reason that we need new transparency media is because we can't count on conventional media to have the guts to stand up for, for uh, uh, revelation of things that, that are sensitive and, you know, that some Americans will find upsetting. And I would add that, you know, we are in some ways in a renaissance when it comes to uh, nonprofit, aggressive local reporting and national reporting from these independent groups and independent journalists. The problem is that it's distributed, it's networked, and it doesn't have the same power that a, a longtime institution like the New York Times has to protect their journalists or to fight back against um, you know, threats to, the, to their freedom of speech and freedom of press. So what we need to do is to create new institutions, new structures that can help support this new changing demographic of journalism. The fact that we have more freelancers on the beat, the fact that we have more nonprofits, that there's more small local organizations out there. And that's really what we're trying to do here. You'll see by the groups that we decided to fund in this first round that we're really interested in people who are pushing the limits, doing reporting in new ways, and really trying to recreate the news in the public interest. Right. I mean, I, I think it's really important to recognize that the future of journalism is, is probably non-profit. I mean, it's certainly probably not advertising-based. Why, why do you think that? Well, because, you know, we've gone from a broadcast to a many-cast model. I mean, one-to-one, one, I mean, one-to-many has been supplanted by one-to that number of people that is interested in that one, or many-to to that number of people that is interested in the voices of that many. You know, it's a very different model. And, and I think it's, this is all for the good because advertising-based media have created increasingly an hallucination. If what you're doing is selling attention, all you want to do is to, is to increase attention. And you can certainly, you know, the Kardashians and endless uh, viewing of violence than you can with the truth. Uh, no, I think it's uh, inevitable that the mainstream media would have an ambivalent attitude toward WikiLeaks. On the one hand, they were tremendously benefited by uh, the revelations there. I think I read recently on the uh, Atlantic blog that they calculated that for a very long period, virtually every other day uh, in the New York Times, he carried stories that uh, related to the WikiLeaks revelations. But on the other hand, Every one of those stories showed up the mainstream press in a considerable sense because they were providing secrets, secrets that had been there all along, in some cases for years. And every one of them was a story that the mainstream press had failed to get. Their investigation earlier had not revealed any one of the things. That's what that made this great outpouring of news all of a sudden, sure. because they were, they were getting it. Now, one of the other groups that we uh, support, the National Security Archive, does wonderful work. I, myself, was the one who suggested that, and everybody uh, joined in right away enthusiastically. But what they do is they print uh, material that they get declassified by Freedom of Information Act, often years after they've made the request. And the request, uh, and by years, I mean seven years, 10 years, 15 years. They're very tenacious and very patient. But that means that thanks to their efforts on appeal and other ways, they drag out of the administration information they've tried to keep secret sometimes for 20 and 40 years. By the way, the Pentagon Papers were just officially declassified for the first time well, in June of last year. That's 40 years after I revealed them. Daniel, uh, uh, to that point, I just so want to share we, with our younger we just on, If we rely on the Freedom of Information Act, totally, it's invaluable, uh, but... 
how do you get the information 10, 20, 40 years late? Uh, in the case of uh, WikiLeaks, in this case, we got it in some cases within months. And, and I know uh, that it's hadn't come out. Forgive me for interrupting you, but I want to point out, you know, when it comes to your beneficiaries, a lot of people are wondering where the money is going, how the money is going. We know that you've already given money to WikiLeaks, Muck, uh, Rock News. Um, and uh, also the uptake, um, among others. And the uh, National Security Archive that I just mentioned. Right. Uh, and, and for our younger Archive. viewers, Daniel, if I will, you know, we've been talking about the connections between WikiLeaks and uh, when you leaked the Pentagon Papers. Um, for those who don't know, in 1971, Daniel Ellsberg was a young military analyst who smuggled top secret government documents and leaked them uh, to the New York Times. The documents exposed the lies and manipulation behind the Vietnam War. Um, and as you know, hopefully they were known as the Pentagon Papers. Uh, in 2009, a documentary film called uh, Daniel, the Most Dangerous Man in America. Um, and the film was made about him uh, and this part of our history. So the title, if you uh, care to know, comes from President uh, Richard Nixon's national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, who after the Pentagon Papers leaked, called Daniel the most dangerous man in America. So I want to show part of the trailer. Thing. Forgive me, go ahead, John Perry. I say among other things. Among other things, yes, of course, on the tapes. Uh, I want to show part of the trailer because there are some interesting parallels, and then I have a question for you, Daniel. Let's just play that clip. This weekend, portions of a highly classified Pentagon document came to light for all the world to see, and brought cries of outrage from Washington. we got to get this son of a bitch. The Times building is encircled by armed guards. We are printing tomorrow a top-secret government document. A name has now come out as the possible source of the Times Pentagon documents. It is that of Daniel Ellsberg, the top policy analyst for the Defense and State Department. I am prepared to answer to all the consequences of these decisions. Henry Kissinger said that Daniel Ellsberg was the most dangerous man in America and he had to be stopped. Daniel Ellsberg, whatever his intentions, gave aid and comfort to the enemy. Daniel. The reason I wanted to show that clip is because uh, Nixon said that you were giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Um, that same argument's being used today against Julian Assange and Bradley Manning. Um, what do you say to that, and is it true? Okay, first of all, those are the very same words, of course, that are being used uh, against Bradley Manning uh, in a military charge, giving aid and comfort to the enemy, which carries a possible death sentence. Now, the prosecutors, or life imprisonment, the prosecutors have said they won't go for the death penalty, or the judge in the hearing could, uh, isn't bound by that. He could, on the basis of that charge, uh, assign the death penalty. More likely, life imprisonment. I faced life imprisonment at the time on 12 felony counts, a possible 115 years in prison. Now, most people hear that, as you just heard from, Henry, uh, from uh, Richard Nixon, aid and comfort to the enemy, uh, as the definition of treason. Strictly speaking, the definition of treason in our, uh, in our Constitution uh, has another phrase in that, saying, waging war against the United States or uh, adhering to its enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Now, nobody really claimed that I adhered to the Viet Cong or any other communist state, and nobody is claiming that Bradley Manning was facing that charge, adhered to the Taliban. Seems we've lost your audio at a very unfortunate time. Um, Daniel, I, we actually can't hear you. In the interim, I don't know if the control room can sort that out. It's such a shame. Uh, I don't even think he's aware. In the meantime, Josh, I do want to ask you. Hey, do we have you back, Daniel? No, we don't. All right, such is life uh, when things go wrong technically. Josh, very quickly, Glenn Greenwald, who's uh, also working with you, described uh, the Endeavor as a project to, to ensure that truly independent journalistic outlets devoted to holding the U.S. government and other powerful factions accountable with transparency and real adversarial journalism um, are supported to the fullest extent. That term adversarial, um, is that really the aim? Yeah, I think that adversarial is a great word uh, for what we're looking for. We, we were talking about adversarial journalism. We're talking about transparency journalism. We're talking about, um, you know, people who bring to light important issues in the public interest and hold our leaders to account. And uh, unfortunately, what we've seen is uh, increasingly that holding our leaders to account 
threatens your ability to do that job, whether it be you know, in retribution, whether it be in um, you know, the, the arrests, et cetera. So what we need to do is to make sure that these organizations have the support, the legal support, the financial support to continue to, to move forward. And for many of them, it's about start getting past the startup phase as we see this new era of nonprofit, non-commercial journalism emerge. We need to help them get past the startup phase and get, get to sustainability. And so what we hope to do is use crowdsourcing and really crowdfund this so that we can actually do a collaborative fundraising effort where instead of having all these critical journalists compete against each other for funding, that we'll actually have them working together uh, for that funding. And we can really have a, a situation where we're bringing more unity to the entire non-commercial ad adversarial journalism field. Dan Perry, I know you had something to add. I, th I think it's important that we recognize that it's not so much adversarial journalism, it's transparency journalism. It's, it's making visible what the public has right to know, that large institutions, whether they're governmental or corporate, would rather the public didn't know. And often the reason that they, that they would rather the public didn't know is because they find these revelations embarrassing, they reveal the incompetence, or often, in, in some cases, the malign intent of those institutions. We're not setting out to be adversarial. We're setting setting out to reveal what ought to be revealed and, and, and what, what in a in a proper democracy uh, would be revealed naturally. Would be and should be. And I appreciate you making that clarification because so much of this is framed uh, as hostile opposition, uh, and to that point, Daniel, uh, a last question. Hopefully your audio is working again. Forgive me for that. Uh, uh, you know, a famous quote of yours is that in Vietnam, you said we weren't on the wrong side. We were the wrong side. Does that still apply to us today? Well, certainly in the case of Iraq. Uh, by the way, as in, uh, as in Vietnam, the issue is not whether the people we were fighting were uh, either saintly, nonviolent, they obviously weren't, whether they were democratic, they weren't actually in either case, uh, or from our general standards, uh, good guys. In the case of Iraq in particular, we were in the position of committing a crime against the peace, of being aggressors, as, uh, as much as when uh, the Soviet Union went into Afghanistan, when Saddam Hussein went into Kuwait, our action was not only uh, unconstitutional in the sense of being based on manipulation of lies to Congress, who uh, alone are given by the Constitution the right to declare war and to get us into war, but it was actually in, in the absence of uh, any authorization by the UN Charter or any need for self-defense. It was clear-cut aggression. So yes, we were the wrong side, and that didn't die uh, in Iraq, I would say. And that means that people who are fighting against us were fighting uh, for a homeland, for independence right. uh, of their country, whether it was going to be democratic or not. And that is true in Afghanistan right today. We shouldn't be in that position. We shouldn't be, you know, earlier as I was listening to some of the other people here when I could hear them, I was thinking of what Tom Paine said in our uh, war of national liberation, the first one in history in our war of independence, when he was sparking it in common sense by uh, denouncing the limitations of courts, of aristocratic monarchical courts, and of having a king. He said, nations should have no secrets, because the secrets of courts, meaning these monarchical courts, right. the secrets of courts, like those of individuals, are ever their defects. And that remains true. I, I don't think, we, none of us think, I think, that our nation needs no secrets, that there are no valid secrets in, a world, uh, in the world we live in, or lived in even then. But most of the secrets are, as John Perry said earlier, to protect them from accountability. No official really wants to be blamed, to be challenged, to be shown up as having lied or, uh, or giving information that would help his rivals to office, possibly lose his job. So they want to control information. The and genius of our form of government right. is that we are the sovereign public and that we have a right to that information and can make informed choices. If the government is given exclusive power to decide what we shall know so that we only get authorized disclosures, never unauthorized disclosures, we can't have and don't have a democracy. And the price of that is 
uh, let's say, wars that are as wrongful and futile for us and as destructive as King George's war against the American states was for him. I've never made that analogy before, but it's a fair one. Well, well, it is a fair one, and on that point... was to prevent such wars. It is a fair one, and on that point, Daniel, I, you know, I apologize for the audio issues, all of you, but gentlemen, this has been a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to join me. And in the spirit of transparency, I'm, you know, such a fan of all of your work, uh, you know, so there's, there's no harm in saying that. Uh, transparency, not always objectivity. How about that? Here at HuffPost Live, the conversation always continues. Thank you so much, uh, John Perry, um, Josh, and Daniel for joining us.